it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Felicia. And uh, uh, everybody knows that Felicia is her in her second, second year. year. Yeah. And uh, uh, <laughs> I'm very excited that we've been meeting every um, Wednesday in Skadi. And uh, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, work um, that integrates both uh, mm -hmm. mapping in the past and the ethnological um, mm -hmm. present uh, it will be really exciting. And the title of part of today's Green Mapping, Margin, Body, and Mind. Please welcome her. Hi, everyone. Um, so for today, I wanted to start off with kind of a brief um, story of how I got into flint napping and kind of it really does guide the way that I've actually started this, um, this research project. Uh, so in general, I started off probably about three, maybe four years now um, where my husband bought me a 50 pound bag of rocks and I just was smashing them together to no avail um, and I made piles and piles of this really beautiful clumpy debitage and I was very proud of them but it wasn't flint napping, right? Um, so I knew that it wasn't getting the kind of, I guess, responses from the stone that I had wanted to get initially. Uh, so I decided to spread out and go onto YouTube and actually just watch people flint napping and try to do it that way. And I made a little bit of progress, um, you know, when I was actually watching somebody do it. Um, and then I decided, well, I still wasn't seeing the type of, um, you know, progress that I had wanted to see, so I figured, Let's go to the Flint Napping Bible, and I bought myself the Whitaker book of Flint Napping, and I improved again, um, just a little bit. But what actually really drove me to the point where I could actually Flint Nap confidently um, was working with partners, right? Being able to go back and forth and have that interaction while Flint Napping. Um, and that is completely, um, just completely revolutionized my ability to Flint Nap. And I think that it's really important to take the social effects of um, you know, of group work into figuring out and flint napping. Um, and I think it's important to bring that back into the archaeological record. Uh, so this is, you know, where, where this project kind of began. And so I'm going through, you'll see here, this is a, a core that I had actually, um, it's an experimental core that I've been working on. Um, and then on the left there is, is one that we actually have in the, um, in, in the archaeological record. Uh, so, I'm looking at the site of Harana, working with Lisa Maher, um, and you can see, you know, this is a Google Earth map, but just very vaguely right there, um, there's our site, and it's a really arid environment, right? Um, at, well, currently it's a very arid environment, but it wasn't always, so during the last glacial maximum, um, it would have been a lot wetter, and, you know, we would have had other steppe environments outside of this, uh, the Azarak Basin, uh, which is outlined over there, and you can see. Uh, which I took from Lisa's work um, in 2016. But just to kind of let you guys know some of the information that we've got going on about the site, um, the Azarak Basin itself is about 12,000 square kilometers, right? And um, it really kind of pulls in uh, water from uh, the Syrian mountains, and it's also fed by um, it's also fed by underwater like aquifers and stuff as well, um, and created actually um, a, an oasis. Let's see if we can get this one to work. Yeah, so it's got this oasis right here um, in the middle. And so you can see over here, we've got three, um, three very large mega sites highlighted. So one within the oasis, Hirana right here, and then Jalat further south. Um, and they're all really fantastic sites. Um, and I think the main thing that I would want to, you know, make sure that you guys are getting away from this is that, you know, although our site is really wonderful and it has this amazing preservation, it's this gorgeous mound, um, it's not the only one, and we need to kind of look at it in the context of all of these other very large mega sites um, that we're dealing with that are also contemporary, right? Um, moving on for the next one. Uh, this one also is taken from Lisa's work in 2016, um, but we're just looking at um, you know different possibilities, right? So we're looking at trade and aggregation and people coming together and leaving. Um, we're looking at possibly seasonal hunter and gatherers um, who are using this site throughout the year, maybe a couple of times, maybe not. Um, but we do have evidence of reuse. Uh, these hut structures that we have are um, they're you know shallow cuts into uh, cultural uh, deposits. And then you actually see a couple of instances where there's biological um, you know, remains that kind of 
you know, stack on top of each other in these hut structures. So it looks like some of them are getting reused. Uh, but also, we have a lot of marine shell that are coming from the Mediterranean Sea um, and, you know, just different items that we know that there's definitely trade going on within um, tens, if not hundreds of kilometers from the site. Um, and, you know, this is going on around 20,000 years ago, right? So that the Paleolithic in the Levant um, spans from 23,000 to 11.6 thousand years ago. Um, and then Hirana itself, right, we're looking at 19.8 to 18.6 thousand years ago. Right. Uh, so this is actually a photo of the Azarac wetlands when we went there um, last summer or in 2016. Um, and so this is, what, this is what it looks like. This is a preserve, right? Um, so uh, this is what it looked like probably even back into the 80s maybe. Um, but they started siphoning off water to send it over to Amman. And so it's, it's been drained quite significantly. But it's also believed that this is potentially what the, um, what the oasis would have looked like, right? Um, and now, this is what we get. Um, this is our site from the top. Um, very different, but also very wonderful for preservation. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, that's, that's the good part of it. Um, we're, you know, it's this entire thing, everything you see across the top here, those are all worked stone tools, right? So they're either tools or they're debitage, um, and it's, it's fantastic. You can't, you know, go a single step without stepping on something. It's, it's incredible. Um, but so yeah, so um, what I really want to go forward and just to kind of, you know, get you guys situated for this, this is actually from the top here, right? So this is Hrana. Um, it's, you know, the dates are around 19,800 to 18,600 and it's about 21,000 square uh, meters. So it's a pretty large site. Um, and then, yeah, within it, we've, we've found, or recently, um, you know, we've, we've got a couple of human burials. We have, we're working on a couple different hut structures, but there's also really amazing caches um, of stone tools. We have marine shell caches. Um, there's a lot of, like, ochre and just some, some really amazing, um, like, work areas and stuff that, that I kind of want to explore a little bit more. There we go. All right. So now to get you guys into my research questions and what, what I've really been playing with for the last year and a half. Um, mainly, it's, it's how um, this knowledge is, is transmitted, right? So I really want to know the cultural um, aspect to this knowledge, right? So we're not just talking about how to flint nap, but we're including the landscape as well, right? So I'm interested in seeing how these people are going out and collecting this, you know, these flint. How do they know, like, where they're at and, you know, kind of trying to figure out um, the different, you know, cultural aspects of it because uh, we're coming kind of from an older idea where, um, you know, we have these very distinct groups and, you know, this particular group creates this particular tool type. And I kind of want to see if we can break away from that and see if maybe education is a better way for us to look at these cultural borders as opposed to the final tool type, right? And the only way for us to get to the education is really looking and refitting some of these cores. Um, so all of these flakes that you guys see along the edges here, um, they're all flakes that I've been dealing with in the particular um, sets of artifacts that I've been working with. And again, this is a, a really nice core um, from one of the huts that I've been working on. Um, but yes, yeah, so just, just so you guys get the questions. Um, so how does the flint napping knowledge get transmitted? And I really want to look at this in kind of a, um, in a temporal sense, right? So, you know, from the early to the middle periods, since we have two periods at Harana, um, I want to see how that kind of changes from the early to the middle, right? Um, can education be used as a proxy for culture in the Paleolithic? I think this is probably one of my favorite questions to, to try to tackle, right? Is, is trying to understand where, you know, where the flint napping knowledge is either coming from or how it's being transmitted and how, like, along which lines, uh, you know, are they going along kin lines or how we can track that information back if we have enough of those uh, sequences. Um, and then number three, how is flint napping socially situated within the Paleolithic life? 
And I feel that that's a really important thing for us to actually try to, to get to um, because we can, we can actually, hopefully, there's been work that, um, there has been work that traces back and is able to determine skill level and everything. I haven't gotten to that point yet where I can do skill level, um, but that's definitely something that I'll be working on in the next couple of years. Um, but yeah, with, with an understanding of skill level, we'll be able to figure out the actual positioning of people while they were flint napping. Um, and we'll go into all of these a little bit further. So um, this is the map of the two areas and the sites. So um, we've got area A, which is from the, the middle epipaleolithic, right? And then area B, which is the early epipaleolithic. Um, the middle epipaleolithic is uh, mostly, we're, we're looking at like geometric microliths. Um, and broad-faced cores, while the early epipaleolithic, we're looking at gracile um, non-geometric um, microliths and more narrow-faced cores. Um, so I'm gonna be focusing on area B since both of the huts that I've been working with are in area B. And I've highlighted these down here. So these five areas are where all of my, uh, where all of my material has come from so far. Um, I do plan on expanding that out, but at this moment I have 43 cores and tens of thousands of pieces of debitage to get through. So, um, you know, it's going to take some time. <laughs> um, so, these are the hut structures, right? So, we've got hut structure one, hut structure two, and we um, excavated this in 2016. Um, and so, there's actually some caches, there's two caches in between these two hut structures. Um, and so you can see that they're, they're very shallow depressions um, in, in you know, previous cultural deposits. They have, um, they're covered in a thin layer of clay. Um, and then they have this really dense, like burnt um, superstructure kind of that comes down over top of it. So it's really easy to identify this really dark black as opposed to this kind of orangey, yellowish, sandy silt that we've got out here. Um, but all of the, the material, all of the cores that I will be talking about for the rest of today um, are really coming from the areas around these hut structures, not necessarily the ones inside of them. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to show you this because this is amazing. I geeked out about this for a while. Um, I can't wait to get my hands on this cache. Um, it's, it's amazing. So, um, so this is one of the caches that they found between the two hut structures. Um, and some in-situ fired rock. Um, and then just to show you guys a little bit about the tool types that we're looking at, uh, we've got the non-geometric microliths, which are very thin and gracile, but they have a lot of retouch across the back. Um, we've got non-geometric, sorry, geometric microliths that are a lot more chunky and they tend to be that trapeze shape. Um, and then these are the bladelet cores that we're dealing with mostly. Um, this is a narrow face bladelet core. Um, and it's, it's the most common one that, that I have in the material that I've been working with. All right, so my approach in general, right, it's, it's pretty much three steps that all kind of come back down to experimental flint napping, right? Um, so step number one is refitting, right? Um, we need to figure out how these sequences were actually done, right? How everybody was flint napping, um, and what, what patterns they were using, what type of problem solving um, were they actually employing in order to create these, these really wonderful, um, these wonderful cores and tools. This one was actually refit uh, by Nigel Goring Morris um, from his site in Shunra 16. Um, and it's, it's fantastic and I really hope that I'll be able to, uh, to get to that point. Um, but again, um, then we, we need to go back to experimental work, right? So in order to understand how these are you know, coming together and or coming apart and going back together, um, there's also a component of me being able to do that. So that way I can actually go forward and, and kind of understand the purpose behind these removals. Uh, I, I think it's, it makes it a little bit more meaningful, at least to me as being a flint napper, to be able to understand what type of struggles they were going through um, and maybe why they were doing these errors or how to fix their errors. Um, so that's, that's the step that I've been on right now, is just trying to reproduce these cores using um, similar approaches that we see in the archaeological record. Um, once we finish all of the refitting, um, I'm really interested in then moving on to the chan right? So not necessarily just of the tool itself, um, but also everything that surrounds it, 
right? So at what point in time are people going out and, and collecting these materials? The, you know, the vast majority of the materials are coming from within 15 kilometers of the site or 20. Um, and so, uh, so we know, like, you know that it's probably something that they have very easy access to. Um, but I really want to know about the knowledge, right? The landscape knowledge and, and how that kind of fits into, um, how it fits into their daily life and, you know, how basically the changes in, in that knowledge is, is seen through the landscape and seen through like which sources they're deciding to pick. Mm -hmm. um, so for these works, so sorry, I went back, um, refitting. So uh, Takakura and Nicole Piaget, she did, or they did some really, really wonderful refitting work um, that I've been following pretty closely um, in order to kind of model and figure out the problems that they ran up against. Um, so that way I can kind of negate some of those problems in my own research. Um, for the Chen Epitoir, I've been pretty heavily leading, uh, leaning on Bleed, Chazen, and Rockman. Rockman did some really, really fantastic work with landscape and um, apprenticeship of landscape. And so the, the entire, you know, I guess the entire project that I'm getting to is, is really the apprenticeship and the learning of the situation. So not necessarily just the, just the teaching and just the flint napping, but it's, it's the learning and the entire system, um, the entire social system that's built around learning how to flint nap. Um, and again, this is something that you know needs a lot of experimental work. Um, I you know would like to do some more raw material surveys. There had been done. Um, there had been some done. I think back in like 2010 or something by um, Dalage, and um, they were fantastic. And so I kind of want to go out and take a couple of looks and see you know find some of the spots that he found and maybe go get some other ones and try to flint out that material. Um, but also, um, in this step, I've been leaning on a lot of ethnography as well. Um, so I've been working on some, um, some work with Junko with uh, the Australian Aborigines and trying to situate how um, this learning and the collection of materials fits into daily life um, in, in other hunter-gatherer societies. Um, and then for the situated learning and communities of practice, right, um, it really comes down to understanding skill level. Um, and so this is going to come through with a lot of experimentation. And I'm not going to go necessarily really deeply into the experiments that I have lined up for today, but if you want to talk about it with me, I'm more than happy to. Um, but I, I have a couple of um, experiments set up and, you know, that are going to be on the, in the way um, in order to determine the actual skill levels of different flint nappers and see what type of errors that they actually create when they're trying to create some of these narrow-faced cores, right? And so that way we can kind of determine, you know, low skill makes this, middle skill makes that, you know, masters make this, and this is how they correct their errors, right? And so once we can be able to determine the skill level from there, then we can actually go back to refitting, right? So the reason why, you know, this is a circle is because once, once we're able to determine the skill level, then potentially we might be able to figure out when we have two or three flint nappers working on the same core. Right? So if we have some mistakes that are really terrible, some really atrocious mistakes that are on these cores, you know, if a master comes through, which ethnographically we know this happens very often, then a master comes through and is like, oh, all right, here you go, fixed up, keep going. Right? So um, in order to kind of mix all of these ideas together, I think it will make a more holistic understanding of how this knowledge is really transmitted. Um, but also, we'll be able to kind of look at spatially how people are situating themselves, whether we have one master who's surrounded by one or two apprentices, or um, in the French Magdalenian, um, where they have some really wonderful examples of like one master and then two people who are slightly skilled, and then like children who are just bashing rocks around the outside, right? And so it's, it's really fantastic that they're able to, to be able to separate that space, and that's something that I would like to do at Harana. All right, um, so experimental work is a huge part of what I've been doing. I'm sure a lot of you guys probably know that I flint nap on Fridays, um, but you're more than welcome to come out if you haven't. Uh, we really, really enjoy it. Uh, when I was in Jordan over the summer, I got the, um, the which fellowship was it? Sorry. Um, yeah, the Kenneth Russell, Russell Memorial Fellowship through the American Center of Oriental Research. 
And with some help from Lisa, I was able to go and um, spend about a week and a half, maybe two weeks in Jordan. And we got to do a lot of lab work. Um, that was the vast majority of our days was um, I went with two of our other um, Jordanian archaeologists who help us there. And they were fantastic in helping me do some of this initial sorting. Uh, but we also went out and collected raw materials so that way I could do experiments at home. Um, it was pretty exciting to try to explain to the people at um, customs that I had two types of rocks. One were archaeological and the other one wasn't. And it was, it was a mess for a little while. But we made it through and I got all of my rocks. <laughs> um, but so you can see, they actually, this is at ACOR. And they set me up with this really gorgeous uh, flint napping area that has like these like grape arbor vines and stuff over top of it, like was it rosemary bushes everywhere. I didn't want to leave. Um, there's so much flint, I could still be flint napping. Um, but they've, you know, I've I've been doing a lot of experimentation with bifaces, um, but also just been trying to get into um, these narrow face cores because that's that's honestly where my research um, kind of well that's where my practice needs to be, um, and so it's it's been a struggle, but I'm getting there. So we'll we'll figure that out. Um, to kind of move on into the actual lab work part of it. Right. Um, when it comes to the lab work, we've got two major steps. So the first one is sorting by color and texture, which uh, Charlene is very familiar with at this point. <laughs> I've had two, uh, two U-Raps helping me out, and they've been fantastic. They haven't mutinied yet, so that's wonderful. Um, but we've got uh, basically setting up each of, so we, over the summer, we had separated things out into their basic typologies. From there, then, we went through and, and used the Munsell color chart in order to determine the colors. Um, we kept a very specific um, like codes for, for the different types of patterning, and then also um, very specific, um, I guess, levels and categories for the textures, right? So we're looking at like sandy, fine, mediocre, glassy. So that way, we can try to get pieces that maybe belong to the same core in the same general area. And so then once that's done, which took us eight months, and it's almost done. <laughs> um, then we move on to matching by color and texture. Um, and so then this is actually going across the different bags. So these were within the bags, and then this is across the bags. Um, so we have this China doll system going on, or sorry, Russian doll system going on, where we've got um, you know, these different colors, right? So these are little bags of different colors and different styles. And then once we have everything from that one particular area, they go into a bigger bag. And then those bags go into another bigger bag. And then so this bag actually has a photo of the core and the color, um, the main colors on the core, as well as um, the, the patterning um, on it. So that way we can kind of try to figure out how, um, how well these pieces are fitting together and, and you know, their potential um, matches. Um, they actually then get double checked at the end and we're kind of in the process of doing that right now is um, doing the double checking to make sure that the colors are pretty consistent throughout. Um, it is, it's, takes a long time. It takes a long time to do. Um, we've got, so this is, this is what that process looks like. So we've got Jose over here working um, where we take up about half of the lab and lay it out. Um, AJ lovingly calls it a fish market of lithics. Um, because it's pretty much what it looks like. <laughs> you walk into the lab and it's just bags and bags and bags of rocks. Um, but it's, it's been the most effective way that we could figure out how to actually um, get these materials that look very similar together with being able to keep, um, being able to keep the context information with them. Um, so you can see this is my favorite um, refit for right now. Um, and it's these three beautiful blades. So you've got one, two, three. Um, and it was brought to my attention that it looks very much like prosciutto, and I can never unsee that. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, so this is number one. Um, but you can see here, right? So we have these, uh, you know, these two flakes and this flake or blade um, that very clearly belong to that same core, right? So they're coming from very different places. They're coming from different places around um, the, the areas that I'm pulling. But it's very clear that, that they actually belong together. So we're, we're capable, we're able to do this. Some of the cores are a little bit trickier because we do have a lot of like sand-toned cores that maybe have a couple of white speckles in it. 
Um, those are tricky and those are very, very big bags, but we'll get through it, we'll figure it out. Um, but right now uh, we have 43 of them that we're working on and potentially a couple more coming out of, of our last bag that we haven't gotten through yet. Um, but so, so this is how we're kind of keeping everything together and, um, and trying to, to get into the actual refitting itself. Um, so the next step of this, what I would really like to add, is doing some 3D photogrammetry. So I just finished up the, um, the photogrammetry workshop in Santa Cruz, which was fantastic. Um, and so this is actually a digital elevation, a digital elevation model uh, that we had done. And um, I think with, with a little bit more resolution, it'll be really wonderful for figuring out errors and understanding um, the different removal processes. But I wanted to kind of end, not on that, hold on. So I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about um, the three models and what they can actually do to, um, to improve my research and, um, and how I would like to, to employ them, right? Uh, so you can see uh, this is pretty awesome. I'm super psyched about it. Um, but it's, it's really, really wonderful, high quality images. Um, and so what we can see here is, uh, stop. Um, we can actually go through and look and see each removal, right? Like I, I totally bashed this platform. Like, so we can actually see these errors and like be able to maneuver it and look at them. But the step that I want to take from here is actually using 3D, 3D photogrammetry as part of the refitting process, right? So what I would want to do is sit and like glue this flake on, take a set of photos, glue this flake on, take a set of photos. So that way we can actually have the entire sequence recorded, like, and, and so that way we can see everything internally and externally but then we can, from here, take out the colors. We can um, you know, kind of do some other manipulation that will allow for, um, for an easier comparison as opposed to just looking at the cores you know, one by one once they've been glued together or looking at the notes um, of you know, how I understood them fitting back together. Uh, we can actually go through and one by one put them back on and compare the different sequences to understand how these different things are interacting with each other. Um, and so I think this, this can be an, an extremely powerful tool for, for understanding uh, the differences between time and space and the differences between like educational approaches, right? So if we have a number of people who are coming to the site um, you know, from different cultural backgrounds where they're learning and you know, being taught how to flint nap in particular ways, um, I, I believe that we'll be able to pick it up in, in these cores and just through the approaches that they're using, through the tools that they're using, um, and even just, just different problem solving strategies. I think that'll be able to let us identify at least which group that they, they learned to flint map in, and then we can kind of understand the different cultural relationships from there. Um, so I think I ended a little bit early. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Um, but I guess any questions? Yeah. Um, I know this is preliminary. You're working on it right now. Have you started to see different styles or different techniques? So. so in, in the cores themselves, yes. Um, there are definitely some cores that have some removals that are bizarre compared to the other ones. Um, and so I'm, I'm very excited and I have my eyes um, pretty well honed out for those at this point um, to kind of see how they differ from the other ones. Um, but I haven't had any refits for those cores yet either. So it's, it's strictly judging by the removals on, on the core faces. Yeah. You mentioned a beautiful blade. Do you think you see uh, evidence that the flint nappers were trying to do something not just utilitarian, but beautiful? I think so. I, I think, um, you know, maybe not in all of the pieces, right? But I do think that there is an aspect of, of you know, f like physical beauty that, that comes into some of these pieces. I know I've seen a couple of pieces of flint that were like, purple with like orangish polka dots and it stopped me from working for a solid five minutes just because it was so beautiful. Um, so I, I do think that it does play a little bit into it. 
Yeah. Um, well, we know that the, most of them are local. Um, so I believe it's, it's 15 kilometers, or is yeah, it 20? 20 20 yeah. Basically. Yeah. We have yet to find stuff we can't find. But, and, but you, and you can differentiate those different sources? Um, I haven't been able to yet, but I honestly haven't tried that yet either. So the, I was thinking about this while she was talking. That might be somewhat confusing. The, there's a big distinction between what she's doing with the color um, versus sourcing. Right. So she's not using the color and the variation in these different sure. textures as a proxy for source. Right. Because it, in any one flip of a crop, as we all know, there's right. some huge exactly. variable mm -hmm. that. Yeah, although there are the chemical tests, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. but even those are pretty <laughs> unreliable, especially when you have very similar geochemistry between right. our crops, which we have in Jordan as well. Yeah. It's in yeah. Yeah. relatively similar conditions. Yeah. But so she's using the color with the idea or the assumption that. Um, Within one core, within a chunk of rock this size, right. you're going to have a minimal enough variation in color and texture right. that it does still be a useful measure to try and get your next door matches. Right. So, right. of course, right. that right. changes a little bit as you realize that you know, one part of what you've refitted is now a little bit different, and then you go and pick out those raw materials. Right. And then yeah. So the, we have some amazing pieces, like so it's the lateral core trimming pieces are some of the pieces that just go completely across, which capture the vast majority of the variety. So we have some pieces that have four or five different colors within one nodule that's about this thick, and like different textures and you know, different patterning that go in between that. Um, so those, those pieces are extremely helpful, and they get, they get like flagged because then that way we know what's inside of them. Um, and then we can kind of go back through and figure out like, okay, so I know like, you know, this particular color and texture belongs to this, even though that these two don't look similar and we can still kind of get them into the right bag according to the core. Yeah, Jinko. So in terms of refitted pieces, how far are they from each other? Like, do you have some of them that are far away from yeah. the original location? Well, so far, I've only been pulling from three different squares, um, and the furthest ones that I have are about three meters from each other. So it's, it's not a very large space at the moment. Um, I do want to kind of expand out a little bit more. Um, but yeah, at, at this point, I'd say the farthest is about three meters. Any other questions? I know it's early days, but um, from what you see in the fragments, that you're looking at, do you have a sense of the range and variability of technologies that I mean, we have? I mean, I'm not a lithic person, mm -hmm. but there's like these sort of classic names out there, you know, Level Lock, Level Lock, yeah. and you know that much better. Um, do you get a sense that all in all, the thousands of pieces you looked at, they're all sort of the same style, or you're seeing, oh my goodness, even though I'm in the same layer, yeah. they're really diverse. I mean, what's your sort of yeah. feeling on that? Um, well, what's, what's really fascinating, um, Josh and I have actually been working in the lab on two different areas. So I've been working mostly on area B, and he's been working a lot on area A. Um, and so between those two areas, from the early to the middle, uh, we have very, very different approaches to the actual, um, like the, the actual maintenance and like, like types of flakes that they're removing. Um, so within, within my particular um, you know, set of artifacts, there are some variabilities. Um, you know, nothing that like, sticks out to me necessarily right now as, you know, oh, this might be a completely new thing. Um, but there, there are definitely some, some very different approaches than some other ones, but nothing as drastic as the ones that you'd see from the early to the middle. Especially two kind of different flavors or personalities. Um, not, not spatially yet. Not yet. Between A and B? Oh, between A and B, yes. Yeah, Sorry, between spatial. A and B, yes. <laughs> that's spatial. Okay, that's yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to add to that. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, the, the really interesting thing about Felicia's project and why we're super excited about it is right now people just assume that those differences are cultural. So that it's this group who does it this way. That the mm -hmm. sure, sure, sure. Sure. And so when you find a Nebekian site in an area that's not supposed to have any, it's supposed to be all Kabar, and people are like, oh, wow, this is crazy. It doesn't make sense. What's going on? And these refitting studies, like the one that she shows, so keep that in mind, and then the refitting studies that she showed, the core 
um, that have been nicely refitted from the southern the Gory Moors. Yeah, the Gory Moors one, yeah. So what he's actually done with all this refitting work, very different yeah. scenario. One site is like three or four hundred pieces that all fit together. So very discreet. One, yeah, very discreet. Yeah. Places. So this refitting is much, much easier and still very time consuming. But what, what he can actually show in this very controlled refitting setting is that even within one site, within one you know, Nebeckian group, there's clearly multiple trajectories for making the same micro or technological stuff. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so things that we couldn't identify by just looking at the assemblages without refitting. Um, and so it, we, we suspect that it's probably the same at all these sites where we just haven't tried refitting. And so we think that's also going to be the case of Toronto, but until we actually do it, we can't prove it. Thank so you. we think that this idea of Barn and Nebeckian is you know, maybe just people doing things slightly differently. Well, you know, it reminds me, if I, if I might add, yeah, yeah. Um, because I'm teaching Anthro 2AC, I've been reading outside of my box, and so I read all this stuff on issue. Uh, Reread it, you know, got yeah. back into it. And, he and they talk about taking him out in the countryside where he used to flint now. And you probably know all about this, Kent. And I don't know if people have been to see it, but he talks about sitting around in a circle that he never kind of napped alone. He mm -hmm. always napped as a group. So I don't know if when they went out, Carrington and Hogarth located where those are. But, and you know, and that whole thing of Shackley having him nap in a different cultural group and all that stuff. I mean, to me, this sounds like you're right. You're doing a same kind of yeah, so that's that's actually where my experimental work is is kind of playing with is um, trying to like get once once I get up to the point where I can reproduce these very confidently, um, then like go through and actually teach students how to do it mm -hmm. right and and be able to kind of like have ourselves situated um, in certain ways right so I'd have different groups of students who would be taught in different kinds of ways right mm -hmm. using like different traditional like learning methods. Um, and then that way we would be able to compare like how they learn either from each other, like from me, how like you know how this learning actually occurs in these groups. Um, but then we can also then keep track of their errors and then how they start to correct their errors and um, you know just the different ways. And I I would hopefully like to get them to actually journal um, their thoughts. So that way, like, you know, as they're, you know, going home and hopefully thinking like, ah, you know, this core, it's just not doing what I wanted it to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I would hope to get that. Um, but <laughs> if I don't, that's fine. But I really want to kind of get into the, the mind of the Flint Nappers and the people who are learning um, and then, you know, see how that if that that's affected in the group. Right. Um, but also when it comes down to um, and doing like understanding the differences between novices and adepts and um, you know masters. Uh, that's another thing that that I've been working on collecting a couple of masters. You know, I've got plenty of novices around, so um, we'll we'll all just kind of like get together and try to figure out um, you know how to reduce these cores to make the types of tools that we want. Um, and collecting the debitage and seeing um, the different skill levels. So exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because there's there are, there are very common things that you see like a novice almost always makes yes, these yeah. like you know battering like, like they're oh. yeah yeah and they they just they just don't know the angles correctly right yeah. so they just hit it and hit it and hit it and it doesn't come off and they just keep going and going yeah <laughs> well so that's that's the point is to then like set up like a typology basically not necessarily a typology but you know kind of like a fluid set of categories where we could then you know line up these are errors that most commonly occur in in novices and these errors most commonly occur in like you know people who are in the middle range and these occur in masters and then that way we can then kind of spatially situate as what well was going as on sourcing yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
one more question. Beth. Is your approach applicable to other assemblages that are already refitted? Because I know that refitting is a huge amount of work. Yeah. Japanese Paleolithic archaeologists are really into it. I know that there are a lot of refitted uh, hmm. examples. But it seems like they're stopping at that point. And the interpretation is not necessarily there. It sounds really exciting. Yeah. But potentially, uh, hmm, there's um, possible um, collaborations in the future. Yeah, I, I would. I would imagine that it would be. Um, you know, as long as all of, like the context <laughs> information. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, done. it's done. And I know um, that in terms of making excavation reports of paleolithic sites, that's yeah. the most time-consuming part. Yeah. So excavation reports are out. The materials are there. But yeah. I haven't seen much of the interpretation process, and there's a lot of criticisms. Why are you guys spending a lot of time for something that I'm not really? Yeah. And. Yeah, I think I think that would be yeah fantastic because really all you would have to do is you know if hopefully they've got like you know water soluble glue, <laughs> yeah. So that way you can kind of like undo it and then redo it. So that way we can see what those sequences are. Um, but yeah, I, I think that would definitely be applicable. Oh wow. <laughs> that's, that's so hard. So you can see how much time was Yeah. Yeah, a lot of time. Yeah. This is just a curiosity and maybe some of the ethnographic analysis stuff as well, but you what what age do you usually think people are starting to learn? Uh, does that vary a lot? So ethnographically it varies a lot. Um, but there's I Kind of from from what I'm seeing, they kind of start younger. Yeah, uh, we got a video of like a three year old running around with a flint knife <laughs> or obsidian knife. <laughs> oh, metal. Um, <laughs> um, but like I I kind of seeing like in in some of the work that Milne and Rockman are doing. Uh, they definitely have people who are younger, around like five or six, who are just kind of like bashing stones together, not really like accomplishing anything, but like trying to mimic stuff. Um, but then you kind of see that like their cognitive abilities just simply aren't there yet. Um, and then they actually get better as, as they get a little bit older. Uh, that was another experiment I really wanted to do, but it's apparently very difficult to find parents who will let me teach their four-year-olds to flint naps. So, you know, <laughs> reasonably so. But yeah, um, I think that's that's kind of something. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, they, they, there is some evidence of people starting as children. Um, and I honestly, I, I'm going into it thinking that there's definitely some level of interaction, whether it's just you know watching um, in the Australian Aborigines, they're not allowed to actually flint nap until they're initiated as adults. Um, however, they are sitting and watching their their you know father's flint nap, right? So there there is still, yeah yeah well, yeah. <laughs> I only I only say fathers because the ethnography strictly speaks about men. They they don't mention women. No, 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 I agree, I agree. I'm, I'm a very strong, I believe that women were definitely flint napping. Are you about the work that Brant and Weedman have done? Brant and Weedman? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll check that out, because I've, it's been driving me nuts, because everybody I've looked at, it's only men, men, men. It's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Right. Thanks, guys.